Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Readers and writers alike, welcome to another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. As always, I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is episode number 51 of the Book Speaks podcast. We're coming up on 52 episodes, folks. We're coming up on our one year anniversary. It was at the end of March 2017 that I <laughs> recorded my first three episodes. Put them all up on the same day, uh, reading from Michael Anderley, Patty Jansen, and Timothy Ellis, and uh, have just been kind of rocking and rolling ever since. So thanks for everybody showing up, listening. I hope you're enjoying these indie author readings. And if you come next week for that special 50-second episode, not 50 seconds, but (laughs) the the episode that will be after the 51st episode. I'm going to be doing kind of a fun catch-up of where are they now on some of the authors, uh, going back and sharing some of my favorite tidbits from the books that I've read from. Um, So it's going to be a fun episode. Do come back and check that out next weekend. Today I'm going to be reading from indie author Ken Ward. The book is Kill Me Tomorrow, and this is uh, ranking in crime, murder, suspense, thrillers, mystery thrillers, and suspense, just to kind of give you an idea. I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually not read Ken Ward's Amazon author bio because I'm not able to locate an Amazon author bio at this time for Ken Ward. Uh, And Ken, if one exists and I'm just stupid, I apologize. (laughs) If you send me a link, I'll read it on the next episode. But um, in the meantime, what I am going to begin with is reading the blurb, the book description on Amazon for Ken's Kill Me Tomorrow, from which I'm reading today. LAPD detective Curtis Vaughn wakes to find footage from his in-home security camera showing his 10-year-old son stabbing him to death while he sleeps. How is this possible, given he's still alive? Racked with guilt, he can't help but feel suspicion toward his little boy, and his wife, Deborah, begins to notice the distance growing between father and son. Unable to articulate how he feels, wanting to shield his wife from the horrific video, a gulf emerges in his marriage as well. Enlisting the help of his department's forensics unit and his fellow detectives, Curtis embarks on a chilling journey to find the truth behind the footage, and soon finds himself on a path laden with murder, secrets, and mayhem that threatens the survival of everyone involved. Good. Nice blurb, Ken. I gotta say, um, the blurb is good. The reason I really wanted to read this today is because sort of on a lark, I just glanced at the look inside uh, and read the first chapter, and I found it so hooky and compelling that there was not a doubt in my mind that I wanted to share this book on the podcast. And I reached out to Ken on Kboards, where I frequently see him as a contributor, and he was uh, immediately very gracious, very kind, said, yes, of course, go ahead, I think that's really cool. So thanks, Ken, for your permission. I really appreciate it. I think you're going to enjoy this reading. Uh, This is from 2017, this book, so it's pretty recent. And Ken, again, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. (laughs) I'm so wrong so many times. But I think, I think Ken, like me, is a recently published indie author. I think he may have even begun, like me, in 2017. So woo-woo, class of 2017. And if I'm incorrect about that, Ken slapped me on the wrist and I'll fix it on the show. 
All right, so um, without any further ado, I'm gonna jump right in. We've had a couple of short episodes here, I know. Again, reminder, that's just because life is busy right now. For me, I work in academia, and um, it's the busy season here post spring break. Also, um, for anyone interested in my personal life, <laughs> I'm almost done with my dissertation. I will very soon be Dr. Ben, which is very exciting. <laughs> it's not in writing or creative writing or podcasting or indie authors or any of that, uh, but it is in the arts. So I feel like it's a somewhat related field, performance arts. Um, and uh, yeah, that is taking up a lot of my time right now. So I haven't been dedicating a lot of time to the show. We've had short episodes. Rest assured, next week, big old episode for the one year anniversary and then smooth sailing after that and hopefully more writing for me as well. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, anyway, without any further ado, on to Ken's wonderfully hooky first chapter for Kill Me Tomorrow. If you enjoy this, do check out the show notes. I'll have a link to Ken's book um, on Amazon. I think because uh, I don't have a website for Ken either, I think I might link to his book on Goodreads too if I find it there. Um, so check that out over at http colon slash slash the book speaks podcast dot wordpress dot com. As always, the reading you're about to hear does not come from an official audiobook and is performed, recorded, and presented here with the author's permission. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you back here next week for the big one-year anniversary episode, and enjoy the reading. Kill Me Tomorrow by Ken Ward Chapter One My ten-year-old son killed me at 1.19 in the morning. At least... That's the time marked on the security footage. Written in digital blue, 011943. That's where I'd stopped the tape, with the first stab. Wallace, our son, stands at the edge of our bed, plunging our biggest kitchen knife again and again into my midsection. I'm asleep. The black and white footage is crystal clear. I can see a black stain expand with every stab. The sheets and duvet soak up pints of my blood. Thirty seconds later, my wife lifts her head. It looks as though it takes her a second to register what is happening. Her mouth opens, probably to let out a scream. Her dark eyes are wide with terror. I do not stir. I'm probably already gone. She jumps across my body toward our son, who continues thrusting the long blade up and down into my lifeless body. The footage freezes on the blurred image of my wife, her mouth agape, her arms outstretched, looming over me like a specter in a white gown. This was how I'd spent my Sunday morning. Fingering the mouse on my desktop, rewinding the footage over and over, re-watching the events captured on the ceiling camera placed just outside our bedroom door in the hallway. I sleep on the side nearest the door. My wife says it makes her feel protected. My son stands not quite back to the camera, more to the side. He stabs me with his right hand. I could not believe my eyes. I had installed the cameras 13 months before. I'm a cop, LAPD. Used to work vice. We put away nearly every major player in the East Side cartel, including the biggest scumbag of all. Horatio Morales. On the day of his arraignment, he had a lackey slide me a note, letting me know me and my family were as good as dead. The department recommended we pack up and move to a different part of the city, said they'd even chip in on the expense. I put in the security cameras instead. And listen, I don't advocate for violence against anyone. But I'd be lying if I told you I didn't sleep a little easier at night when, six months into his life sentence at San Quentin, 
Someone slit Morales' throat, ear to ear. Yes, he survived the attack, but it meant he'd had a target on his back inside, and likely meant he'd forgotten about the likes of me. That had been my hope, anyway. But then, seeing that footage made it all a moot point. Any easy sleep I'd had came to an end the morning I discovered the footage of my son killing me. How was this even possible? This had to be someone's idea of a practical joke, right? The guys and gals at work were always trying to pull one over on each other. We were always razzing our co-workers, always trying to get each other's goat. It's part and parcel with the job. You almost have to do it or you risk losing your mind to the madness. But this, this was something beyond. The footage looked spooky real. That really was my son. That's really my wife, Deborah. I know who I married. I know she would never go along with a joke like that. It's not her style. And I know she wouldn't put our son in a position to pretend to be stabbing his dad. I played and replayed that footage over and over and over. I couldn't look away. Then my wife woke up, and I heard her coming toward my home office. Good morning, she said in a sleepy voice. Her tousled hair perfectly framed her pretty face. Morning. She walked into the room, and I quickly clicked open the internet browser. What are you doing? She asked, looking at the computer monitor behind me. Nothing, I said, just checking the news. Haven't heard from Buddy yet. He's in his room watching cartoons. I checked my watch. 11.10 a.m. You want me to make you some eggs? She came over and wrapped her arms around my neck and pressed her weary cheek to the top of my head. No, she said. I have to meet Rachel for yoga. It's supposed to be there at 11.30. You're not going to make it. Just watch me. She pressed her lips to mine and walked off to the bathroom. I checked over my shoulder and then clicked back to the security footage. There I was, in crisp black and white, dying again and again. I yanked the USB stick from its port and shoved it into the pocket of my robe. I checked to make sure the file hadn't been transferred to the hard drive. I had no intention of sharing this footage with my wife. I didn't want to share the footage with anyone. It didn't make any sense. It had me questioning my own sanity. After my successful stint in Vice, I got my gold shield. I was promoted to homicide 11 months before that fateful Sunday morning. I loved working murder police. My partner, Jim Heward, was a good guy and a good detective. We got along well. He was 10 years my senior, but had been on the job only one year longer. He didn't join the police until he was in his 30s, after career in the military. We liked to bust each other's balls, but I always knew I could count on him, and I liked to think he felt the same about me. I didn't believe for a second he'd even want to pull a practical joke like faking footage of Wallace stabbing me. No way. We liked to joke around, but... At the end of the day, we had a great professional relationship. My wife liked him a lot, too. He called me and Deborah the prom king and queen. I remember when we'd first started working together, the moniker bothered me a little. But to be honest, it hadn't been the first time people had remarked that we looked like the couple you see on the top of a wedding cake. Of course, I always told everyone I'd married up, and I meant it. Deborah was the real looker of the two of us. Her shine reflected on me a little. I wasn't complaining. 
I'd heard the shower in our ensuite shut off. Deborah rushed around in the bedroom. She rushed into the office in her yoga outfit and pecked me on my stubby cheek. Ouch, she said. Someone needs a shave. Have fun, I said. Always. She disappeared out the door. I heard the car pull out of the drive. I sat in my oversized office chair, staring out the window for a long time. Then I felt a tug on the arm of my robe. I must have jumped five feet in the air. It was Wallace. My arm instinctively covered the pocket in which I'd placed the USB stick. Hey, buddy, cartoon's over? Yeah. You want something to eat? I couldn't help but pull back a little as my son moved in close to my side. Maybe some cereal? You want me to go get it for you? No. He walked off to the kitchen. My head was spinning as I ran that footage repeatedly in my mind. Was it an illusion? Maybe somehow what I was watching was a corrupted video file from a movie or a TV show? No. That was our house. That was Wallace and Deborah. Most terrifying of all, that was me, laying there in pools of black blood, dead. I fished the USB from my pocket and stuck it into the port again. I right-clicked the file and checked the date on it. September 16th, 2018. A Sunday. I ran the mouse over to the live footage captured by that particular camera. There was the door to our room, the unmade bed. I pulled the stick from the desktop and walked to our room. I stood in the doorway looking down at my side of the bed. I stood there staring for a longest time. The bottom sheet was wrinkled, but clean. I got down on my knees and ran my hand along the sheet. I must be going crazy, I remember thinking. I grabbed the duvet and spread it over the bed. I inspected it close, looking for any traces of blood. There were none. Back at my desk, I'd found another USB drive in the drawer. I inserted it into the port and pulled up that hallway camera. I hit record and walked back to the bedroom. I stood in front of the doorway beneath the small black camera dome on the hall ceiling and waved my arms like an idiot. I went to the bed and laid down for about 20 seconds. Of course, Wallace had to walk in at this moment. What are you doing, Dad? To say that the sudden appearance of my son standing beside the bed as I'd laid there caused me to jump completely out of my skin would be an understatement of epic proportions. Suddenly, I'd become entirely fearful of my little ten-year-old. I sat up immediately and swung my legs over the bed and planted my feet firmly on the hardwood. Nothing. I said to him, a lump the size of a greyhound bus clogging my throat. Are you having a nap? No, buddy, just laying down for a second. Why? Oh, I just felt like it is all. Tough to explain to children about all the weird little things we do. They want to know the why of everything. Mind you, this wasn't just a weird little thing. I wanted to check and see if the software on my computer worked properly and actually was recording the footage captured on the cameras I'd set up. Do you have any homework or anything you need uh, done for tomorrow? No. Nope. Well, aren't you lucky? When's mom getting home? A little later, buddy. Why don't you call up Jeff, see what he's doing? He's in San Diego with his mom. Oh, well, uh, why don't you go outside? 
some of your friends might want to play. Play? He made a disgusted face that let me know I'd used a term that was somehow beneath him. Apparently, in the 26 years since I'd been a 10-year-old, the phrase play had become lame. Or maybe I was remembering wrong. Maybe when I was 10 years old, I'd already thought I'd outgrown the word, too. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why are you trying to push your son away? Clearly, he wants your attention. I hear you. But you have to understand, as inexplicable as it was, I just watched hyper-realistic footage of my boy stabbing me to death. Even an hour and a half later, that kind of thing is going to leave a mark on you. Sure, I could have tried to shake it off and try to chalk it up to some kind of game my mind was playing on me and have the two of us go out in the yard for a game of catch, but try to put yourself in my shoes. If you'd seen footage like that from the night before, are you telling me you wouldn't try to get to the bottom of it ASAP? I remembered the Xbox game I'd taken from him two weeks before. Punishment for something he'd done that in that moment I couldn't even remember what it was. That was my out. I stood up from the bed and walked to the closet. I reached up to the shelf and pulled down the game. Here, I handed him the plastic container. His eyes lit up. For real? Yes. Consider this the official end of your grounding. Just don't do it again. I couldn't even tell you what that was, but he seemed to get the message. I won't, he said. Thanks, Dad. Don't mention it. He jogged off to his room, and it wasn't long before I heard explosions and gunfire echoing down the hall. Parenting 101. I walked back to my office and checked the recording. Sure enough, the camera captured the entirety of my arm waving and me lying in the bed and Wallace scaring the bejesus out of me. Just like it recorded my fatherhood neglect via video games. It was all there. So the camera worked. The software worked. The USB worked. It all worked. What the hell was going on? This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash Benjamin Douglas Books dot wordpress.com and of course if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook feel free to contact me at benjamin douglas books at gmail.com thanks for joining me today i hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend <laughs>